And I suppose we are live. A very good afternoon to Brussels. Uh, welcome to the next session of this ESPAS annual conference. Uh, my name is Eva Peshova. I am the Japan Chair at the Center for Security, Diplomacy and Strategy of the Brussels School of Governance. And it is my great pleasure to moderate this session that looks at transatlantic cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. And more specifically, how can it counterbalance the uh, Chinese rousing footprint? Now, to anyone who has been focusing on the Indo-Pacific, of course, China is the greatest and single point of interest um, because of its economic importance, because of, because of its rising uh, assertiveness in its neighborhood, because of its rising military buildup, uh, some of its domestic worrying uh, recent considerations and this kind of growing uh, autocratic shift. And uh, of course, more recently, because uh, of its rapprochement with Russia, which is perhaps something that has brought a greater attention on China. China in, in Europe. Um, now, far from being a regional issue, China is becoming a global challenge, a global concern that needs to be addressed jointly uh, among like-minded democratic powers, which of course brings the transatlantic relation and the transatlantic approach to China uh, to the spotlight. And I can uh, surely assess that in the decade to come, this is actually one of the most uh, worrying uh, trends, one of the questions that we'll really need to focus on if we are uh, looking at the kind of future uh, challenges for Europe, which is the point of ESPAS, which looks at some of the long-term analysis and foresight for European security. So I think this question certainly deserves to be tackled in this conference. Now, I'm more than happy to be here with four absolutely outstanding speakers from across the world, with Virle Nowens, who is Senior Research Fellow at the, um, at the Royal United Service Institute, and she heads also the uh, Indo-Pacific Program at RUSI, joining us from London. Thank you very much, Virle, for being here. Uh, from Tokyo, we have Yuichi Hosoya, Professor of International Politics at the Keio University, and a a renowned expert on international uh, security in Japan. Thank you very much, Yuichi, for joining us. Uh, from Washington, uh, we have Max Bergman, the director of the Europe program at CSIS, the Center for Security and International Studies uh, in Washington. And finally, but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Ronja Kemping from the SWP Senior Fellow at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs from Berlin. Thank you, Ronja, for joining us as well. Uh, a very quick housekeeping uh, note. Uh, we will be discussing for about 35 minutes, which includes the initial input and our little panel discussion, after which we will open the floor for questions. Uh, you can post your questions questions on Slido, uh, you have the references right underneath, or of course we will be also taking questions from the floor to from you who are physically present in, in Brussels. So um, without further ado, let me turn to our first uh, speaker, Virli, if I might start with you. You have been, of course, following very closely the EU's engagement in the Indo-Pacific, but have also recently published on 
specifically the topic of this panel, on the transatlantic cooperation uh, on China. You highlighted obviously some of the difficulties uh, that this relationship has, uh, some of the competing elements between uh, the US and Europe on China. In a nutshell, where, what is the current state of cooperation uh, between the US and Europe on China? And do you see a progress? Do you see some of the shifting attitudes in light of, of the recent developments and some of the worrying uh, moves that we see uh, on the side of China in the last six months? Thank you so much, uh, Eva, and thank you to Espas uh, for having me here today. Um, I think this is a really timely and, and interesting question. You know, over the last few years, we've seen a, an immense amount of movement in this area when it comes to the transatlantic relationship, uh, particularly around issues and um, concerns around China, um, you know, in the area of technology, in the area of trade as well. And, and we've seen things get set up, you know, various different platforms and, and ways of engagement, be it the trade and technology, Council, be it uh, reportedly discussions, for example, between the UK and, and the US on Taiwan and, and what there needs to be done there, or how at least um, you know you can you can tone down tensions or be prepared for uh, an increase in those. Um, so there's a lot of different engagement across the board. And of course, this is now also being wrapped up in, I think, a, a, a greater uh, movement in Europe uh, and an engagement in Europe in the wider Indo-Pacific to have an Indo-Pacific approach as well. So it, it, I think it falls into a, a wider context than just that, that pure relationship on China. I mean, I think there are there has been a lot of different movements, um, sometimes together, but also uh, individually, for example, initiatives on, uh, on infrastructure, discussions on trade and technology, as I said. But there are also still differences that remain. You see the United States, for example, take a very forward-leading approach on, say, export controls now on um, semiconductors and, uh, and supercomputing. So I think there's a, a sense that the United States would like to see more progress in, the, in some of these areas. Uh, and you see of course, in Europe, a, a very difficult circumstance at the moment economically um, with a focus on Ukraine. Um, I wouldn't say that that has detracted um, the understanding uh, of, of the challenge that China presents. I think the UK, the EU, you know, maintain that, uh, that China is a systemic uh, challenge in that respect. Um, but it does mean that resources are limited. And so, um, you know, strategic focus as well needs to also be maintained on the Euro-Atlantic region. I would say, though, that with Ukraine specifically, for example, that link between the Russia-China relationship has really highlighted the interconnectedness uh, and the interdependence between European security and Indo-Pacific security. That varies to different extents, and we've just published uh, a new paper with Chatham House uh, that's just out today, so I highly encourage everyone to read it uh, on the differences between the transatlantic actors on uh, concerns around China in the Indo-Pacific and, and what the approach is uh, priorities and, and avenues for engagement are. So those are both in terms of enabling factors and inhibiting factors. There's a wide range there. But I think overall, we're further uh, down the line of kind of being more aligned than we were a few years ago. Well, that's rather encouraging news, and I know what I will be reading right after this. Thank you very much. But let's uh, let's uh, continue. Yuichi, um, uh, if we stick to China, obviously, I mean, you've been uh, following the Japanese foreign and security policy, uh, and especially the, the Jap China-Japan relation. Um, as we speak, I believe that uh, Prime Minister Kishida is, is meeting with his, uh, with his Chinese counterpart, the first after three years. That's the big news. What is uh, actually the Japanese-China strategy? Because uh, to it, it often seems to be, Japan seems to be a role model, you know, in its approach to China. So what really falls, uh, what's the package? What, what falls into the Japan's China strategy, if there is one? Well, thank you very much indeed, Eva, uh, for giving me a great question, and I'm really glad to be in this session. Uh, let me focus on the Japanese policy or Japanese approach to China, because this year marks 50th anniversary of the diplomatic novelization between the two countries. This is one thing. The other thing is, as you emphasize on, just one hour before, there was the first summit meeting between Prime Minister Kishida and President Xi after three years between the two countries. So in the sense, 
we are seeing some of the moves, new trends in the Sino-Japanese relations, and we need to analyze or evaluate what we are seeing. And uh, there is a mixture of two different directions. One direction is coming from the United States. United States is, as you know, promoting a kind of a decoupling policy between the two sides. And particularly the United States government is trying to create a kind of a new supply chain to provide that really resilient, strong semiconductor. And we are joining, I mean, the Japan is joining in that group by leaving a bit from uh, mainland China. So in the sense, we are creating in East Asia a new type of supply chain among like-minded countries like United States, Japan, Taiwan, and Korea. And China, or even China and Korea is trying to join it. So this is a new trend. The other trend is that in the last 50 years, I think it, that the Japan is, has been always within a top group to try to uh, introduce China into the international community. So in the sense, Japan has been always trying to prioritize engagement policy to much more confrontational policy. In the sense, I think that the Kishida is trying to revitalize this new impetus for engagement policy in China. So we have two different vectors, two different directions. The point is whether the Prime Minister Kishida can combine two different directions. It will be a very difficult task. And Prime Minister Kishida needs to present his vision on the Japanese strategy towards China in Japan's new national security strategy, but it will be difficult to present it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuichi. I will get back, I think, to the national security strategy because it's about to be to be published in, in a couple of weeks, so we can come back to it perhaps later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Max, uh, watching Europe in, in, in Washington, uh, you seem to often allude to the fact that uh, uh, Europe is somehow shooting above its weight, that it could be, you know, it, it, it could be much more powerful if it somehow put its act together. And uh, so, so what would be, you know, how could it really kind of become uh, a, a more uh, respected uh, international player from Washington's perspective? Is it, is it through a greater military role? Uh, or you know, how can we kind of split from this junior partner role? Well, I think from, from uh, well, first, thank, thanks so much, uh, Ava, and it's great to, great to be with everybody. Um, I, you know, on the one hand, Washington always views its partners as in some ways junior, even if they're they're not, um, but that's our own sort of biases. I think, look, I think over the last um, nine months since the war began, uh, it, it there has been um, a light bulb has gone off in Washington about the geopolitical importance of, of Europe. Uh, the the strong sanctions response, I think, caught everyone off guard. Um, the, uh, you know, constant concerns about will Europe uh, stick together? Will Europe, you know, uh, try to negotiate behind everyone's back and 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 show weakness? Just simply hasn't been the case. And I think there's a lot of appreciation in Washington for how Europe is coping with the current energy crisis. So I think in some ways Europe has shown uh, its steel and its resolve. And I also think the the EU Trade and Tech Council. I think the the fundamental motivation for that from the U.S. side was actually uh, the Indo-Pacific was actually China. The sense, and if you look at the the basic sort of Press release talking points uh, from the Wash from the U.S. side about shaping the global rules uh, of the road on when it comes to economic regulations and, and trade and technology was really about working with uh, with Europe, which has an economy the same size as the United States and China, and trying to get on the same page. And I think one of the challenges that we found uh, we talk about European weaknesses a lot, but it's you know when it comes to trade and tech and areas where the EU has competencies, uh, the EU is, is quite able to you know figure out a position and come to the table it's much harder on the US side in trying to wrangle uh, all these uh, essentially domestically focused agencies like Commerce Department uh the Treasury Department uh, as a former State Department official I was much more comfortable working with the Pentagon than with some of my domestic counterparts so I think that has been a challenge frankly on the US side um but when it comes to Europe look uh 
Uh, the Biden administration just put forward another request uh, from Congress for $37 billion uh, for Ukraine, which would basically make the amount that the United States has, uh, will obligate for Ukraine around $100 billion this year. The entire EU budget is, you know, 150 to 180 billion uh, dollars. So oftentimes, the United, that's something the United States does not appreciate, that we say, why doesn't the EU step up and do more? Well, a lot of foreign policy capacity is simply the economic capacity to follow through. A lot of uh, when it comes to defense, it is also about resources. Uh, I have been an advocate of the United States starting to push for greater EU resources when it comes to defense and foreign policy. And I also think the U.S. should push for uh, greater cohesion or, or, or qualitative majority voting when it comes to foreign policy decisions. And I think this is something that many uh, Europeans support as well, that trying to have one foreign policy position uh, is, is would be in the interest of the United States. Maybe one last point here. Um, I think, you know, there's a perception in Europe that the U.S. position towards Europe is that defense arms sales are a crucial part of America's foreign policy globally and especially in, in Europe. What I can say is, having dealt with this account of the State Department, uh, arms sales to many other regions of the world are, the U.S. is incredibly restrictive, that it is not the overriding goal of U.S. foreign policy to just sell arms. The problem is that when it comes to Europe, it's very easy to, that there's no human rights concerns, there's no technology concerns, or very few technology concerns. So the, app, the, the door is open for U.S. industry to build relationships. But one of the things that we've now found after, uh, because of the Ukraine war, is that conventional warfare requires having a very robust defense industrial base. And there is no European defense industrial base. There are a bunch of national defense industrial bases. And when every country buys American, which in some ways is good for it's good for American defense industry, it may not be good for the transatlantic alliance overall. And I think there's a growing recognition in the United States that the EU needs to, uh, you know, ha could play a very important role in starting to facilitate uh, greater defense industrial base uh, consolidation coordination. Uh, and that's something that I think Washington should support. We've been opposed to it for 25 odd years, but I think that's an area where. The, if the Europeans come up with a big, bold proposal and then go to Washington and say, we want to do this to basically support our defense industrial base and to build capacity that will help NATO, I think it would be very hard for, for Washington and especially this administration to say no. Thank you very much, Max. That's, uh, that's again, something that we can perhaps uh, continue discussing uh, later on, because I think it's a very, very interesting point also for our own uh, European uh, decision makers. Um, finally, uh, I would like to turn to Ronya. Uh, if she's there, I can't see her on my screen. So, uh, Ronya, we Germany, of course, the uh, economic powerhouse of, of Europe, has been uh, not only pub you know recently more and more interested in the Indo-Pacific. We have seen the Indo-Pacific uh, strategic guidelines being published uh, two years ago. We have seen um, an increasing interest in security terms as well with the deployment of the of the Bayern frigate in the region. That all has attracted to really uh, the attention on, on on Germans a lot of expectations also from Germany uh, and its role in the region. Uh, on the other hand, of course, and I'm, I'm sure you expect this question um the the visit uh of uh, of Schultz to um to China very recently has attracted a lot of criticism and a lot of questions both in the region and inside Europe now I know it's extremely difficult but if you had to kind of summarize uh, the, the domestic mood uh when it comes to Germany's policy towards in the Pacific where do we stand now? hear you. Thank you very much. That's a very tricky, <laughs> that's a very uh, tricky uh, question, of course. Um, I think um, we are standing a bit um, in, in the middle. Um, on the one hand side, I would say, as you said, um, we have since 2020, um, the Indo-Pacific guidelines, and um, we have um, the revision, the second revision uh, out uh, since uh, September of these guidelines, and we see a lot of progress that have been done, a lot of um, uh, engagement, uh, be it traveling, uh, you know, trips to the region um, from our, um, well, tr chancellor, um, 
our um, president uh, or uh, the foreign minister. We have especially strengthened, I guess, our relations with Japan, with Australia, um, participated, as you said, in various um, military uh, maneuvers in, in the region, not only the Fregat Bayern, um, but, uh, but also other uh, maneuvers in, in Australia, uh, especially. Um, so on the one hand side, you can see a rising um, engagement uh, and Germany really sticking uh, to the guidelines and wanted to implement it. Um, and on the other hand, um, I guess, as you said, um, we are still waiting for Germany's uh, China strategy. Um, the government, uh, the tripartite uh, government, or tripartisan government promised uh, to publish Germany's first uh, strategy on China, we expect it um, in the first half of 2023. Uh, um, but I also wanted to, um, uh, you know, like have a closer look maybe on what could be some form of uh, Chancellor Scholz's um, foreign policy agenda in a bit of a larger um, sense. He, I think, first um, shares the concern uh, of the previous uh, Merkel uh, government that uh, the, the rise of China is, of course, a challenge to Germany's national security, but especially economic interests uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, at, la at, at large. You know that 20% of German exportations go to the Indo-Pacific uh, region. So it's a very important uh, part of the world uh, for, for Germany's economy. On the other hand, I guess what Scholz does reject is the idea of a great power uh, bargaining materializing in the region. He is a strong believer uh, in a multipolar, uh, multilateral uh, uh, wor world, multipolar, but where uh, uh, the European Union and Germany with it risks um, to be sidelined. Um, it's no wonder, I guess, that he, um, since he is in office 10 months uh, from now, has already visited uh, 20 uh, countries, um, uh, which is a huge, uh, huge amount of uh, uh, countries. Uh, if you assume that he is very busy with um, the economic, and <laughs> especially energy crisis um, and the war uh, in Ukraine. Um, but he thinks, I guess, that, um, you know, um, Asian countries such as India, Indonesia, Vietnam, but also uh, South American ones like Argentina, Brazil, also Nigeria, Egypt, uh, South Africa, to mention some African countries, uh, will have risen within the next 20 years to become economically strong and politically self-confident players and that we have to invest in our relationship with these countries as we do have to invest uh, in our relationship uh, with, uh, with, with the Indo-Pacific uh, in general and China um, in a particular. So his first, I guess, foreign policy approach is to treat partners with respect and really um, not only focus uh, uh, on one region in particular, but really have a, a broader focus. The second, uh, I think, thing um, that you have to keep in mind is that this chancellor in particular has a view of Germany as a Germany as a foreign uh, policy actor, as a facilitator, a mediator, a facilitator. He sees uh, the role of our country of bringing together um, countries in Europe, North, South, Eastern Europe. Um, well, he has engaged with the Western, uh, re-engaged uh, not only our country, but the European Union uh, with the Western Balkans. And he tries to be, as he calls it himself, prudent and decisive when it comes uh, to um, Ukraine, especially on arms delivery. So be more, uh, not someone who shapes uh, international relations or who leads, but really someone who facilitates um, the exchange. And I think the third um, uh, motto um, that, that we can already de depict um, is that of course, German foreign policy must not hit the Germans. And this is where uh, I guess uh, China comes in uh, in the picture again. In all of his speeches, he emphasizes um, that other markets um, offer great uh, opportunities, especially in the uh, Indo-Pacific. 
The problem is that you have to attract uh, Germany's business companies' uh, interests um, to um, these markets, uh, which is why I think he tries to uh, to take as much uh, companies um, with uh, with him on delegation trip. But he also says, and this is important, I guess, for our panel, uh, that Germany is not seeking economic decoupling um, from uh, China and the Chinese um, market. And uh, here again, I guess, um, which which you uh, or, or a lot of uh, people in the European Union, but also abroad, might not like to hear, is that you know he is not decoupling from the market. He sees that decoupling from China would not only, I think, harm our overall economic, but also foreign policy goals, but would have, like you know, like decoupling from uh, Russia, have uh, too much of a cost right now uh, for German uh, citizens. So I guess his third, as I said, light motif is our his foreign policy must not hurt his own population. And I'll stop here for the moment. <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you very much, Ronya. I think it really uh, puts everything into context. Uh, yeah, and, and you're very right to recall also the, the kind of focus of the current administration on all, all the regions, right? So it's it's really in the spirit of this inclusiveness. And in fact, I think the, the, the willingness to not support economic decoupling is something that uh, uh, quite a few partners share. And we just heard from, from Yuichi on the Japanese side that that is also a concern from Jap for Japan. So I think we need to just look uh, um, at, at the real, and um, this is a real part of, of the discussion. But let me then follow up with another round, because we, we touched upon many, many interesting uh, topics uh, in, in your interventions. And um, while we kind of set the, the overall toll on, uh, tone on the European approach or, or you know, the US transatlantic approach to the Indo-Pacific, it seems that one, one interesting question that comes to my mind, and it will be for Virley, uh, if she can hear me, would be um, to look at it from the Chinese perspective. You know, um, what is the thing? Uh, again, perhaps thinking a little bit of uh, ahead, what is the thing that China fears uh, in greater kind of transatlantic coordination? Should that uh, materialize? I mean, what what is the biggest fear from the perspective of Chinese? Policy. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it depends on the area that you're looking at, right? So um, specifically on, say, um, technology, there is a concern that uh, China does, of course, still rely on, uh, on uh, accessing uh, certain advanced technologies that it needs for its own domestic development, um, but which from a transatlantic and from, uh, you know, a, a European perspective, for example, could have dual use applications as well and so um you know that that is a, a balance that that everyone is trying to strike um but for china having access to that still uh, remains incredibly important so if there is greater transatlantic um unity on this on on deciding what technologies uh, china can and cannot access uh, then that is problematic for china's own um you know domestic ambitions be it economic or otherwise um, I would also say that more generally, the you know the transatlantic divide is something that has suited China quite well. More generally, um, it has been able to uh, engage with partners bilaterally. It, that's its preferred, uh, usually its preferred uh, method of engagement to try and really um, base relations on on some of the positive aspects um, and not necessarily see a unified approach uh, between the United States and one which they think. Uh, is chiefly led by the United States. And of course, they see the United States as its main competitor. Uh, so if you do have a greater alliance between the transatlantic community, then their uh, expectation is that Europe will align itself more closely with the United States. And that is problematic for China in a number of ways. And problematic for Europe? Well, and problematic for Europe, I mean, if it aligns with the United States or yeah. what would you mean? I mean, I don't. I think that depends on on the context in which it takes place, right? So, uh, as we said, and as we've heard, there's been growing concern around uh, some elements of Chinese behavior and policy uh, that isn't necessarily, um, you know, congruent with the international rules based order as uh, Europe and the United States see it. Um, so, uh, you know, that isn't necessarily problematic, but. 
um, yes, there, there still needs to be, and I think we've heard that already from the perspective of Europe, there still needs to be a, a door open to dialogue and to engagement. And to be fair, we see that from the United States as well now with uh, the resumption uh, of dialogue on uh, things like climate change. So it really depends on the, the sector and the, the issue that you're looking at. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much, um, Verily. Um, Yuichi, uh, let me come back to the national security strategy that you alluded to. Uh, we know it's been uh, in the making for some time. It's been uh, the update that has been expected for, well, almost 10 years. Um, what can we expect uh, to see in the strategy when it comes to Europe and uh, kind of cooperation with uh, Europe and transatlantic uh, partners? I mean, is there going to be a specific reference? Because we see a very two different directions. I mean, there is the Japan-US uh, pillar that is strong and, and always been there. And then there is this, you know, diversification of actors, which includes Europe, but also Australia and, and India and others. Is there going to be perhaps a reflection on the transatlantic cooperation or perhaps NATO uh, in that context uh, specifically? Right. Uh, first of all, I suppose that the new Japan's national security strategy, which will come, as you said, within a few weeks, will be uh, much, much more unclear than the previous one, which was published in 2013 for some reason. First of all, uh, it seems that Prime Minister Kishida is perhaps more confrontational to China than Shinzo Abe. Shinzo Abe had been trying to create a stable and friendly relationship with China, regardless of his nationalist ideology. So it means that during the time of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, we could enjoy quite a stable and a cooperative relationship between the two countries, Japan and China. So this was a basic line of Abe's strategy towards China, but largely reflecting the current atmosphere of international relations. I think that uh, Prime Minister Kishida has been trying to promote new economic security policy, which would be sided with the United States in trying to promote a kind of a decoupling uh, between the two sides, between the liberal democracies and authoritarian regimes. That's why uh, Kishida has been showing quite robust sanction towards Russia, unlike what Prime Minister Abe did in 2014 after the integration of Crimea Peninsula by Russia. So this is a new trend. So even though Kishida as a person is usually regarded as liberal wing within the ruling party LDP, but his policy has been perhaps much more hawkish than Shinzo Abe's policy towards China because he has been focusing on the importance of human rights, importance of the economic security as, and some other reasons why it would be difficult for Japan to be closer to China. But at the same time, uh, prime minister's power is now much weaker than the time of Shinzo Abe. That's why uh, inter-ministerial ad uh, 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 adjustment is now more important than before, uh, uh, having seen the decline of prime ministers of his power. So it means that uh, Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has much stronger voice in deciding Japan's policy towards China. And it seems to me that uh, Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been always preferring uh, Japan's stable cooperative relationship with China to much more co uh, confrontational or decoupling policy. So it means that we are seeing the combination of a very strong stance of Prime Minister uh, Kishida. Uh, uh, and we saw it when he uh, talked in the G20 summit meeting in Indonesia by condemning some of the behavior, human wrongs within China. But at the same time, I suppose that because Japan's new national security strategy paper will be directed by the cooperation between MOFA, Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Japan's Ministry of Defense, that's why the strategic paper would be much more vague than the current robust stance of Prime Minister Kishida. Uh, 
Thank you very much. And, and I hope we will find more of the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, concept in the, in the national security strategy as well. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Um, Max, um, coming back to, to Washington, and, and, and I don't want to, you to do any kind of crystal ball um, imagining, but you know, since ESPAS reminded me that they're really looking for long-term uh, analysis and foresight and trends, and one question that uh, kind of keeps being on, I suppose, a lot of people's mind when we followed, uh, well, recently the midterm elections, but uh, kind of looking ahead in the domestic uh, at the domestic political scene in in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, what do you see as kind of worst case scenarios in the domestic on the domestic spheres when it comes to transatlantic cooperation and especially I mean the topic of of today's discussion let's say in the Pacific and China and in what terms. Yeah, uh, well, great question. Difficult, uh, difficult to answer. I mean, I think, um, you know, we just had a very interesting midterm election in which uh, the kind of uh, uh, Trump uh, endorsed candidates did quite badly. Uh, we're, we're about to enter a, a period of great instability in American politics, uh, where we don't know if President Biden will run for re-election, so there may be a Democratic primary. Uh, there is now a, a concerted Republican effort to kind of uh, remove to move Donald Trump from being the leader of the Republican Party, and there's going to be a, a I think quite contentious Republican primary. Um, so it's a little uncertain, I think, where the future trajectory of American politics are. However, I do think the fact that this midterm elections punished candidates that were on the um, more extremes, that were taking sort of more anti-establishment positions. Uh, I, I think is good for Europe, is good for transatlantic relations, because that is sort of the, the bipartisan consensus that exists for Ukraine assistance, for NATO, um, I think should be strengthened. So the impact, I think, when it comes to when we think about the Indo-Pacific, that there is real bipartisan agreement when it comes to uh, addressing China. Uh, you know, you can tell that because the Republican critiques of the Biden administration are that they should do what they're doing, but do it faster and stronger and spend more money and, and be tougher. Not necessarily any kind of real thematic critique of, of, of the policy. Now, some may have certain uh, differences, but it generally, there's real consensus that the United States needs to take China very seriously. I do think there is a growing consensus that Europe can play an important role uh, in how we think about the Indo-Pacific. I think that there is a, a concern, though, that if Europe becomes... Um, uh, if the if the economic recession that looks to be hitting Europe uh, reduces European willingness to provide support to Ukraine, uh, a, a metric that the United States Congress uh, really looks at is security assistance to Ukraine. Uh, it's kind of become the new 2%. And if there isn't uh, increasing funding for the European peace facility or uh, European weapon flows really come to a trickle, I think that will be looked on uh, very negatively. I think that will negatively impact transatlantic relations. Uh, and while Donald uh, Trump may move to the side, um, there is the potential for another sort of anti-transatlanticist -trans anti president, a uh, more populist president that looks at Europe and says, Europe is rich. Why aren't you doing more? Uh, we're going to focus on Asia. And the other element is that if there were to be um, a, a military event in, in the Indo-Pacific, whether it's Taiwan or elsewhere, uh, U.S. national security assets would would move from Europe. So we may be at a high watermark, I think, for transatlantic relations. Uh, and the last point I would just say is we may be on the cusp of a new climate war, uh, a climate trade war uh, between the U.S. and Europe. And I really hope that we can figure this out. I think European responses to this have been incredibly over the top. America just did something miraculous. It passed the ma major climate bill. Uh, should be applauded. And yes, that's going to support American uh, industries. And we need to find a way to uh, hopefully uh, get through some of the, the trade fallout. Uh, but I could see that being a, a major bone of contention that would sour, I think, the Democratic Party when it comes to Europe. If Europeans are taking retaliatory measures against American uh, uh, unions and, and companies, uh, that, that could get really messy very quickly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Max. I mean, I know it's a difficult question, but I think it's it's always good to to know where we were stepping at a little bit. But you touched upon um, 
a very, very important question. And this is actually something that I wanted to discuss uh, in, in as a follow up with, with all of you. But before I do that, let me just remind the audience, please, now it's time to already start posting your questions because we will be getting uh, to them right after this. But my last question, uh, and that's starting with Ronya as well, and it follows up on what, what Max said, because you, you mentioned um, uh, the Chancellor's uh, Schultz uh, kind of conciliatory role or, or, or approach to, to conflicts in general. And obviously the kind of uh, elephant in the room here when we talk about conflicts is is Taiwan. Uh, and again, since we're doing a little bit of a foresighting uh, exercise, what uh, do you see, and it's again an extremely complicated question, obviously, uh, the Taiwan contingency kind of thinking in Germany and in Europe, of course, uh, and I would like to afterwards follow up with, with perhaps Birli and, and, and uh, other of our speakers' uh, idea on this. Um, when it comes to transatlantic, first from the European position, but then, of course, on, on some sort of transatlantic role sharing or, or a coordinated response on, on such a painful issue. Well, when it comes to Germany, I think the year again, um, you know, the, the evaluation uh, uh, report um, of uh, September 2022 uh, on the Indo-Pacific guidelines have been for the first time, uh, I think um, mentioning uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, and it said that for us, um, it, for, for us, for Germany, for the German government, the conflict um, or the question of Taiwan can only be, of course, uh, resolved peacefully and diplomatically, and can only be resolved if the if if both sides um, come to terms peacefully. Um, so uh, on the other hand, I think we have to take into account that we were mentioning uh, Germany's uh, growing military presence uh, in the region uh, in 2022 um, when we took part uh, in the in the in the maneuver, um, we did well. German uh, uh, neither ships nor air, air, uh, aircrafts um, flew or, or shipped through the Strait of Taiwan. So we were. I think the government was very careful not, um, you know, like uh, to let uh, anyone know uh, that we would we would uh, be willing to take sides. Uh, so the, the message directed to China was quite clear. I mean, this is not a maneuver directed against uh, you and your interest uh, in, in, in the region. So for now, I think, um, you know, there's still some struggle uh, going uh, on inside, uh, inside the government here in Germany. I mentioned Charles seeing China uh, as a partner still, whereas his two coalition partners, the Greens and the Liberals, um, tend to see China more as a rival and want to have a much stronger German language uh, uh, on uh, on China. And so for now, it's very difficult, I think, uh, um, to have, uh, as you said, a longer term uh, vision uh, of, of Germany's policy, because there is too much internal struggling uh, going on right now on this uh, on this issue. I'm sorry that I cannot give a better answer. <laughs> no, but that's that's uh, that's all really great and of course we're very much aware how how difficult these these questions are but of, obviously keeping some sort of communication channels open is is absolutely crucial in this in this sort of uh, in this sort of thinking in the meantime uh we have several questions actually from our online audience to those who do not i should remind you uh do not have it i should remind the the password the slido code is espas2022 so you can continue keeping, uh, you can continue posting your questions. But in fact, our audience has been uh, interested in the same in the same topics uh, that we are discussing now. So Taiwan is actually on the top of uh, of everyone's head, uh, obviously in light of uh, the some of the recent um, uh, more bellicose uh, language that we hear uh, from Beijing. 
seeing, um, and perhaps I know that Virla has been focusing also on Taiwan, I'm sorry to be pushing it to you, but what do you see uh, as a sort of a more realistic scenario? Uh, literally, the, I mean, if I quote the question is, will there be an invasion of Taiwan anytime soon? So this is very straightforward. Uh, <laughs> it, what is your assessment of the situation in light of your knowledge of, of, um, of the communist regime and the current situation? Well, I do not have a crystal ball, and I think there's only one person who really knows whether um, there will be, you know, a conflict across the Taiwan Strait, or at least from the Chinese side, which would be, I think, Xi Jinping, uh, and nobody can read his mind. So it is difficult to try and assess what a timeline might look like, and I think that is exactly why we've seen such a diverse range of opinions as to when we could imagine uh, a Chinese move on uh, on Taiwan, if it indeed were, you know, were to happen. So we've heard everything from 2023, 2024 to 20, you know, 27, 2035, 2049. Um, it'll depend on a lot of different factors, I think. You know, I think the uh, the statement that one uh, senior official in, in Taiwan mentioned uh, this year, which was just because you have the capabilities, just because China has the capabilities, doesn't mean it will use them necessarily immediately. And so I think there is the, the wider context of uh, how China sees its international environment, how it sees its relationship going with the United States and Taiwan specifically, um, you know, what is... Does it see its its strategic timeline kind of shrinking in that respect? Uh, and then also, what is the domestic situation within China itself? I think those are all factors that play into this. So it, that is not easy to necessarily put a specific timestamp on. Um, but if I could just touch on very quickly on what the role for Europe might be, I think, you know, we think about this quite narrowly sometimes, and it's not necessarily just about sending ships, for example, to the Taiwan Strait. There is a wider ecosystem to consider in terms of policy responses, and this could be everything from diplomatic signaling publicly and privately before we even get there to try and strengthen deterrence to economic measures that could be imposed uh, if there is a, a unilateral uh, change of the status quo against uh, across the Taiwan Strait to of course you know those those key defense industrial questions that uh, that Max rightfully pointed out and then of course also doing things like using your your military assets where you have them in place to maintain uh, stability uh, in key sea lines of communication internationally so we have to think, I think, a little bit more broadly uh, about Europeans' uh, potential roles in, in a Taiwan scenario. Thank you. Thank you, Verley. Um, and actually, another question that basically just digs deeper into what we've been just discussing is what is the concrete response scenario of a Chinese attack on Taiwan? Um, and, and that's exactly what, what you started. But if I could perhaps broaden it up uh, to the topic of this panel, which was transatlantic. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, either Yuichi or, or Max could take this question, uh, because I think perhaps uh, on the Japanese perspective would be quite interesting uh, in term, because Japan is immediately exposed to this uh, and has been uh, already in August and you know has, has really the kind of first-hand experience of this conflict. What do you see, what, what would Japan or countries in the region expect from Europe uh, in, in such an unfortunate uh, context? Right. Uh, first of all, we are expecting that once the uh, contingency happens, a huge numbers of ballistic missile will come to both Japan and Taiwan. It will come soon. And it is extremely difficult for Japan to resist all of these attacks. So uh, we are learning lessons from Ukrainian experience because Ukraine has been surviving in the initial few weeks alone. So uh, in the beginning, uh, I, I remember that many people uh, expected that it would be extremely difficult for Ukraine to survive under the heavy Russian attack. So we need to survive, I mean, Japan and Taiwan or some other countries, we need to survive those attacks. And one of the best things that we can hope for is that Japan shouldn't be isolated. Taiwan shouldn't be isolated. And the international community must show resolve as well as a strong solidarity to condemn such invasion attacks. And then 
little by little, maybe Japan and Taiwan will receive some support from countries like Europe. And then it will be more difficult for China to continue those attacks. So if the attack will stop in a few weeks, maybe Japan or Taiwan can survive. And it depends on how European country will survive because I think that China is much more skillful than Russia uh, in legitimizing its action, why it is necessary. And maybe they will uh, uh, heavily criticize both Japan, the United States, Taiwan for their behavior to make those attacks happen. So in that sense, we have to refuse and resist those narrative which China will uh, uh, will present. And uh, then we need to show international solidarity. And I'm sure that Europe would, uh, would be the key because China would criticize the United States undoubtedly. And China would hope for a European uh, 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 a kind of uh, silence in these or neutrality in these kind of conflicts. So in a sense, I think European re reaction to these kind of conflict would be the key to the answer to the peace and the stability after a few weeks of attacks. Okay, so we're actually, you know, the, thank you for, for pointing out the, the kind of realistic uh, scenario, which is, which is quite scary and very difficult, obviously. But since we have a last five minute left, I'm left with two questions that um, kind of stand out. And one is following on what you were saying, Yuichi, about the uh, EU to stay kind of out of it, stay neutral. And it's a question from the Young Talent Network, whether the EU Sinatra doctrine uh, can be applied under the current geopolitical situation and does the EU have the ability to go its own way? So it precisely actually follows on what you were saying, whether it should or not is, is yet another question. And the other question, and I will come back to all of you afterwards, just for your very, very final thought, uh, to me sounds like the most optimistic one, whether climate change uh, can be basically something that will bring China and, and the rest of the world closer together. It seems to me like one of those alien attacks question, you know, in, 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 in dramatic, in science fiction movies where the world gets together at last. So perhaps that that's, you know, and I'm looking at Max because he alluded to this, you know, climate crisis basically being something that we will need to be dealing with before we need to deal with China. Uh, but I'll leave you with this two final questions. You can or do not have to reply. If you just have a, a final one minute to wrap it up, do you think that climate is going to save us all uh, in a kind of proverbial way? And, and can Europe actually afford to, to you know, keep doing it its own way? Uh, or anything else you may want to ask. And uh, Max, uh, just to give you some equal amount to speak in, Max, you'd be last, uh, you'd be the next for your one minute wrap up. Okay, uh, that's a lot to address in one minute. I want me to say quickly on, on a, the Taiwan scenario that I think what would happen if there's a Taiwan scenario is the United States would call on Europeans and say, you must, must speak out strongly, we're doing sanctions, who's got naval ships, who's got air assets. And it wouldn't be, a NATO response, because it would be very difficult collectively for Europe to, to be that cohesive. But I think certain European countries would be like, well, we got some stuff, or we're going to do other things, as Virly uh, alluded to. So I think it would very much, Europe becoming stronger militarily is very good, I think, for, um, for our Asian allies, for the transatlantic alliance in general, and how we posture toward, um, toward China. Uh, on climate, I mean, I am very hopeful that climate will be the the new cohesive glue that brings together the transatlantic relationship, uh, because what the United States is about to do, or is doing with the Inflation Reduction Act, is going to be a rapid transformation of our economy, uh, such that we are probably going to spend not $300 billion, which is noted in that bill, but close to a, a trillion, uh, and that will rapidly decarbonize our economy. At which point, that is a net good. Uh, and so we have to figure out these trade issues. But really, if we can create a transatlantic uh, climate economy where you have green tech, green industry, uh, and its manufacturing base is in Europe and the United States and Canada and, and elsewhere, uh, that will be extremely important. 
I do think that when it comes to engagement with China, I think in some ways, yes, we need to engage with China on climate. It's very important. But China is doing this out of their own selfish uh, interests. And really, it's about, I think, not having our broader economic disputes spill over into the climate uh, industrial areas. So we want Chinese solar panels to continue to flow to Europe and Germany. We want the prices to continue to drop. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure this is the way that we'll have uh, Sino-American harmony, but I do think that's a, an area that we don't want to have Sino-American tension. Provided both take it seriously, yeah. Um, Aronia, very fast. Uh, okay, we're supposed to end now, so but I feel <laughs> really bad for not giving you the opportunity to really say just a few words at the end. So very, very quick, please. I, I try. Okay, very, very I think you, you, you were right saying that we have to uh, learn some lessons from um, in the Ukraine war. Um, and I think the lesson that we as the transatlantic community can learn when it comes to Taiwan scenario is that complementarity matters. Um, we have been extremely complementary um, between NATO, the US, Europe, um, in, in all uh, areas of, of politics. And if we continue um, to cooperate in this spirit um, on the Taiwan Strait uh, question, I guess uh, that would be uh, another, uh, and I'm not mentioning climate, but that would be another hopeful and positive scenario for both sides of the Atlantic. Thank you for looking on the positive side. Really, last one. Two sentences. Um, just to say that, you know, I think uh, initiatives like the Mineral Security Partnership, for example, are really interesting. So that's something that I'll be looking at closely and keeping an eye on. But um, look, I'm not going to take up more time uh, than this just to say thank you to all for a really fascinating discussion. And I wish we had another hour. <laughs> Absolutely. 55 minutes for uh, such a broad topic and only four speakers. Yuichi, do you want to still say your last words or I can wrap it up? No, 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 no. I just enjoy. Thank you very much indeed. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much for joining you. Apologies if you didn't get your equal share of, of time, but it's been very difficult to, to squeeze all these inter interesting topics into one. Uh, I would just like to remind the audience that there will be a following panel in starting just in four minutes. So we are only uh, one minute late, so it's not too bad. I would like to thank very much uh, all our speakers uh, for joining from literally four sides of the world. So the next panel, um, the next conversation will be uh, between Klaus Welle, the Secretary General of the European Parliament, and Fiona Hill of the Brookings Institution, a former senior advisor at the White House. So stay tuned or stay connected uh, if you want to listen to the, the, the rest of the conference. And otherwise, I would like to thank you once more for joining in for this fascinating uh, discussion. I hope to see you in person soon sometime. <laughs> thank you very much.